How worse discrimination and racism can be. Often the imagination ends, but the havoc of the worst forms of discrimination can never be blurred out. Today, most people don't know about the concentration camps the blacks were forced to live in, much like the concentration camps in which Jews used to live when Hitler was ruling. But there is a difference. Hitler's rule liberated Jews, but discrimination and racial segregation with blacks in housing never ended. Sad it may sound, but America's Department of Housing and Urban Development had policies that segregated blacks, kept them away from white inhabited areas, and structurally made blacks poor enough not to afford homes. This is the story of when the American state was involved in racism, building the notorious ghettos where blacks would live. And this encouraged whites to ban blacks from entering restaurants, public spaces, and even offices. Welcome to a new episode of Black Culture Diary, a channel where we talk about less known and hidden black history, culture, arts, and lost civilization. We scrutinize history here to bring the black culture back on the surface again. In this episode, we will debunk the history of racial housing in black America and the facts often swept under the carpet. Let's get started. Everything started after the Civil War when people in America and government officials in general were afraid of the blacks. Since they had feelings of white supremacy in them, allowing blacks to live in the United States would wipe away the difference, Americans thought. According to Ferris State University, Many American Christian ministers accepted white as the chosen people of God and blacks as natural slaves who should not be allowed to live with whites. When the Civil War ended in 1865, several American states made black codes limiting black people's ability to vote, buy property, and have jobs. But the Reconstruction Act of 1867 somehow gave black people their rights under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Blacks were allowed to vote leading them to participate actively in politics. African American were fighting legal battles to have equal rights until the time of disappointment came when the Supreme Court of the United States gave a verdict in favor of equal but separate facilities in the Plessy v. Ferguson case. In other words, under the white supremacist era, the Supreme Court decided that black people could have equal rights. However, they had to live separately, away from the white towns. This was the day in 1896 when the American state had absorbed racism and discrimination in its structure. This was the first time a state's institution had legalized racism and segregation, thus building the foundation of Jim Crow laws. These laws were formulated in the 19th and 20th centuries that legalized racism, segregation, and discrimination. They were formulated when the southern United States was being rebuilt after the Civil War. They separated black and white people in public places such as schools, and made it difficult for African Americans to vote by using poll taxes and literacy tests. Besides institutions following the Jim Crow laws, a white supremacist terrorist group called the Ku Klux Klan, or KKK, was enforcing these laws. Later, there was a court case about Homer Plessy, a black man who bought a first-class train ticket and sat in the all-white part of the train on purpose. The case went to the Supreme Court, which said segregation was okay, as long as the facilities for black and white people were the same. Justice John Marshall Harlan disagreed, saying that separating people in this way made an unequal system. Then came the real estate industry, which absorbed the Jim Crow laws. Before we continue further, tell us, are you enjoying the video? If yes, please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and natural superiority. Let's continue now. During the early 1900s, the real estate industry grew alongside racial segregationist policies and made residential segregation a key part of their code of conduct for agents. Despite a 1917 Supreme Court ruling that city codes requiring segregation were unconstitutional, the industry found a way to implement racially restrictive covenants in property deeds and homeowners associations. For example, a subdivision outside Seattle adopted racial restrictions in 1941 prohibiting non-white people from owning or occupying any unit. The government was complicit in these practices, with federal funding for housing explicitly segregated. The government actively supported housing segregation, with the mindset of government community development and housing authorities being largely identical to the private real estate industry. One notorious government policy enforcing segregation was redlining. In 1933, as part of New Deal efforts to rebuild after the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt created the Homeowners Loan Corporation. 
It rated neighborhoods based on their desirability for mortgage lending, giving lower ratings to areas with higher minority populations. These areas, known as redlined neighborhoods, receive the least financial support, perpetuating the economic disenfranchisement of minority communities. In other words, such policies were being made that structurally kept African Americans away from white towns. The Federal Housing Administration followed suit and formulated policies that reflected racial segregation. FHA made standard rules for giving loans and provided mortgage insurance to banks, protecting them from losing money if people couldn't repay their loans. The government gave white homeowners better terms for loans, so home ownership in America increased from 30% to over 60% between 1930 and 1960. But non-white people didn't benefit much from this. Whites were being encouraged to own property, while African Americans were being pushed into segregational towns they were allowed to live in. In 1948, the Supreme Court stopped courts from enforcing racially restrictive covenants, but they still allowed their use. Some people continued to use them but couldn't rely on the courts to make them enforceable. As a result, towns began using zoning laws to keep minority groups out of certain neighborhoods. It should be noted that redlining and Jim Crow laws were not limited to housing only. The major objective was to segregate all kinds of social and economic life. Therefore, towns presented a picture of segregation. In the northern towns, no black could be seen in white areas. All restaurants, schools, offices, and public spaces were for white only. And in the southern areas, the same was the case. But here, only blacks could live with a poor quality of life. But in 1954, the Supreme Court made a landmark decision against segregation in American schools. The court said that having separate schools for black and white children was inherently unequal and harmed black Americans. The court used research by two black psychologists, Kenneth B. Clark and Mamie Phipps Clark, who studied how segregation hurt black school children's mental health. Then came the Fair Housing Act. It became a law in April 1968, following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and racial justice riots that spread across the U.S. This law made it illegal to discriminate against people based on their race regarding housing. Unfortunately, it couldn't change the long-lasting effects of a century of policies that caused segregation in communities like Westchester County and surrounding areas. Even if black people wanted to live in white areas, they could not because they were intentionally limited from opportunities. That's why black towns were overflowing with black people in the poorest living conditions white white towns were prospering. Did you know that the American state itself was promoting racism? How would it have been to be an African-American in the 19th and 20th century, staying away from white towns, white restaurants, white offices, white waiting halls, and white offices? Let us know in the comments section right below. Do the ghettos still exist, separating blacks from the rest of the world? Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody is talking about the black culture, civilization, history, and the evidence proving black superiority. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.